Well, welcome divas and dudes to Powerhouse Bakery. It's so nice to have you here. And I love the month of March. As I'd mentioned, I, I love the flowers and it just feels like excitement when spring starts to emerge, right? Things are finally starting to look green. So I love it. And so this month, we're gonna talk about one of my absolute favorite topics and that's fitness. Um, I title our theme for the month, Fitness Fanatics, because um, before I started Powerhouse Bakery, actually kind of in the interim of leaving HEB and starting Powerhouse Bakery, I started this really cool little nonprofit to get, getting kids active. So Fitness Fanatics was this nonprofit that we started and it was really getting neighborhood kids involved in just getting outside and playing. So it involved the parents being good chaperones and you know allowing there to be play because so often um, I feel like in this era, kids are much more into exercising their fingers and not exercising their muscles and so it was a really fun adventure um, a, another lady and I did this and so it's still going on and it's just really fun to know that um, we can encourage what is intrinsic and that is movement and if we're not careful sometimes our brain overpowers our muscles and we forget how good it feels to move and so I know I'm speaking to the choir because you guys as divas and dudes um, love to exercise and so what I wanted to do in the next weeks is um, tell you a little bit about muscles, about the physiology of muscles, and how wonderful it is that muscles are gonna respond to what we ask of them. And so, yes, we need to nourish them, and yes, we need to exercise them. We need to rest them. We need to stretch them and lubricate the joints because the skeleton is nothing without the muscles. And so, uh, as we age, of course, things do change, can't help it, but um, we also know that with wisdom comes power and we can do some great things to mitigate the changes that we don't want and emphasize the changes that we do want. And so that's what I'm really hoping I can do in the next few weeks is help you understand the beauty of our human physiology all around muscles. Um, and so, you know, when we, when we think of fitness, it should be fun. I, I'm actually training a, um, a lady right now that is in her 60s and she's never exercised. And so it's so foreign, you know, exercise should feel good, but if you're not used to it, it's like, well, is that pain good or is that pain bad? <laughs> you know, we're, we're careful because we don't want to hurt a body part. Heaven forbid we would, you know, slow ourselves down. But, you know, when I'm training her, it helped me really understand that um, fitness should be fun. And then we have to understand the body cues that our, our body gives us so that we can understand what's a, a good pain and maybe a, a stop pain. Anybody ever fear, experience a, a stop pain? Like, oh, yeah. don't go any farther? No. Yes. Back. Yes, right? Low back, knees, those joints that are definitely an uh, uh, area or a bone of contention. Um, and so what I hope is to really help you see everything that you need to know about fueling and protecting uh, an active body at any age. And so what we're going to really do today is kind of go over the mechanics of the muscles. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of components that interact with the mechanics of muscle. Um, we're gonna talk about the types of muscle. So we've got skeletal. So give me an example of a skeletal muscle. Bicep. Yes, bicep. Um, so the bicep muscle is what moves the lower arm to the upper arm. So the only thing the muscle can do is contract, get smaller, and it brings the bones together, right? So skeletal muscle is cool because it brings bones closer together. Uh, cardiac muscle is really cool because without cardiac muscles, pretty much nothing else would matter, <laughs> right? Um, and so today I wanna learn a little bit about the differences of the muscle makeup of cardiac versus skeleton. And then um, we have the smooth muscle. And you know, we kinda don't think too much about smooth muscle. It's kinda cool because so much of what the smooth muscle does, we don't really have to think about. Um, Similar to cardiac muscle, smooth muscle has the ability to have a rhythmic 
movement, meaning that uh, like a pacemaker cell in the cardiac as well as almost a pacemaker cell in smooth muscle, once you get the rhythm going, it's, um, it can self-propagate, it can keep going. Just like when you're in a NIA class and you don't have to think anymore of the movements because now it almost becomes rhythmic because your brain learns the ability to really have this, this fluidity to motion. But that's because our brains are so good at understanding um, continual movement. But the point is important that cardiac and smooth muscle have a very specific cell in there that can be a pacemaker initiator and then it can keep going on its own. We don't have to think about our stomach contracting. We don't have to think about the villi in our hair follicle to contract when we get cold, right? It just does it. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting uh, organs that use the smooth muscle uh, for, for movement. Um, and so I love this picture of my big muscle guy on your slides. Um, and so guess what kind of muscle he's showing off? Skeletal muscle, right? <laughs> right, not photoshopped, I'm gonna guess. Uh, he's a dude from the 60s, I'm guessing. But you know, we, we often just think of the skeletal muscle as being the predominant muscle. And so one thing that I really wanna have as a takeaway is that um, of course, skeletal muscle is important, but um, without these other two types of muscles, we um, cannot function without them. So there's um, physiological differences in the muscles. There's also metabolic differences in the muscles. And so to me, that just makes it so exciting. And so um, if you wanna take notes, I'm on the si slide with the big muscly guy. The skeletal muscle, um, what is unique in, in this is that it really functions as a unit. So you have these little muscle cells and the way that it brings muscle together is it goes from one state to another state and it's basically closing together. So it goes from one width to another width and that's the contraction. And so if you can imagine thousands and thousands of cells just sliding together, and that's what causes the muscles to bring the bones together, pretty cool. And of course, when we think of it on a large scale, we can cha challenge our muscles enough so that this physiological process isn't enough. So what does it have to do? It has to get stronger and bigger and more of them. So that's the hypertrophy. So as we get big biceps and, and big burly quadriceps muscles, that's happening because we're asking our muscles to do something that it's, it's trying to do, but it doesn't have enough strength to do. And so eating protein will certainly help, but it doesn't, it isn't the game changer because the physiology is there and the energy that the muscle really takes is what? Glucose. It doesn't take protein to make this action happen. So I think it's kind of cool. We often think you need protein. Well, we need protein to build the muscle after it breaks down. So we ask the muscle to do something that it can't really do and, and we can kind of eke it out and then it's sore. So what, what do we do? We broke down the muscle and then we go to sleep, our body rejuvenates. That's when the protein has to come into play and help to rebuild it better and stronger. But just know that the, at the simplest state, this beautiful action is really just these muscle cells sliding together in order to bring one bone closer to the next bone. And it does that with glucose as its primary energy source. And then protein is really only used to rebuild the muscle once uh, it's broken down. Cardiac muscle is a little different in look. It's striated. And so when you see muscle that is cardiac muscle, you can, you can see it in a microscope and it, of course it has the little nuclei. Cardiac muscle only has one nucleus per cell. Skeletal muscle has many, which there's great implications because that means that the skeletal muscle can really change because it's got all those nuclei in there, all that DNA. Interesting, when we're born, the number of cardiac cells that we have is about the same as when, so that they will grow a little bit in childhood, these, these muscle cells, for, um, the cardiac, so heart muscle cells. Heart, 
cells of the heart. Um, but what's really cool is even as we age, these cells really only um, over, they, they produce or re replicate very little. We're, we're, we have the same heart cells, almost half of them, that we are born with. Muscle cells, on the other hand, can change a lot. And so again, you see the little skinny guy turn into the big muscular guy. It's because of the external stimulus that we're putting on it. So I think it's pretty cool that heart muscle is just how God made us. It doesn't change much. There might be um, as much as 50% turnover through your entire lifespan of just replacing cells and making them stronger. So it's pretty cool that we're um, gonna stick with the muscles that are the heart cells that we were born with. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the process of hypertrophy. Have you ever heard of that word, hypertrophy? That's the expanding or the getting stronger of the muscle. And so, you know, there's a lot of influences around people. You know some people are gonna be able to um, get muscles really quickly, right? They, young boys for sure, um, people that seem to just have a mesomorph or a body type that grows muscles quickly. You know anybody like that, male and female? So genetics plays a big role in hypertrophy. Um, kind of what you're born with. So again, like the heart cell, the muscle cells still have a big influence you know, with genetics. We can only do so much. And you probably know some people that are just a naturally good runner. They have a whole different cell makeup in their quadriceps than someone who actually hates to run. They'd much rather sit and read a book, right? Genetics is gonna determine how much their muscles can grow or change in relation to, uh, of course, the environment that we put on them. And of course, gender. We, we know that hormones have a big influence. We know that just the way God made us, men are stronger than women. And we don't have to take that as an insult, we divas, right? I hear lots of uh, uh, Bible sermons about this, you know, that it, just because they're stronger doesn't mean they're smarter and uh, more capable, right? We all know who's more capable in some areas, uh, multitasking and, you know, et cetera. You know, I, but it's fun to realize that the, the gender differences absolutely can make the muscles so much stronger. And so let them go do the hunting and we'll do the cooking and we'll stay safe at home in the cave while he goes out and gets the, the sword and fights the wild beast, right? Um, but I do love the fact that we have a lot of influence for how muscles can change based on you know, our gender. And we know that testosterone is a, one of the big uh, androgens or the hormones that influence growth. Um, of course, men have more testosterone than women, but women do have testosterone. And so I love the fact that that influences the, our muscle cells as well. A really interesting tidbit as I'm doing this research that I found is uh, for women who uh, are in menopause uh, or as their estrogen is gradually declining, their muscle mass loss does not increase after menopause. And that's really, right? My eyebrows raised too. I'm like, what? I thought, I thought, yeah, right? And so as we think about gender differences, and I'm gonna get to it right now with age, and it really ties in because Testosterone and estrogen are the primary sex hormones that determine, of course, gender. And as we age, um, men go through a andropause, right? Um, and women go through menopause. So that just means that gradually over many years, men's testosterone declines. With women, we all know it's a little more sudden. We notice it in a smaller few years rather than a decade. And then if women decide to do hormone replacement therapy, what happens is this um, decreases the amount of free testosterone in our blood. So it actually does not help with our muscle building to use hormone replacement. And so when we take hormone replacement therapy, it actually decreases the free testosterone in the blood. Like 
Right, you wouldn't take it anyway. And a lot of us don't take hormone replacement therapy anyway. But there's a lot of interest around how do we mitigate age-related muscle loss, which we're gonna talk about in a second. And you know, it's just something that I learned, which I thought was interesting. Our, our expectation would be that if we supplement estrogen, we should feel more young and more youthful, but it doesn't correlate with gaining more muscle. It actually decreases our testosterone that's in our body already, and it does not help with you know, getting stronger. Of course, we know that with age, there's um, a lot of natural things that happen, and we have a lot of things we can do to help improve that. So let's keep going, because that's the fun part, what we can do. Um, so when we think of skeletal muscle, I mentioned briefly that it moves bone into action. So if you've ever gone to a chiropractor and you have an achy shoulder and you say, okay, doc, I need you to fix my shoulder. So can you realign me? Now, if you have, if you have a problem with a bone and the muscle is out of balance, what do you think is going to happen after you leave his office? It goes right back. And that's because the muscles are so key. Muscles move bone. So when you have an alignment problem and your bones are uh, not working, you're having a pain and you go to a chiropractor, he can do this manually with his strength, but until your muscles are put into better balance, it's gonna go right back. So when I, when I think about how important the muscles are in the movement of bone, I always wanna say, don't jump to a, um, a chiropractor too soon because they don't necessarily have all the pieces to the puzzle to make you feel better. Anybody know how many muscles we have? <laughs> I gave you a little help. 600 muscles in the body. A lot. I, I even tried to Google how many different movements could we come up with. And of course, there's planes of movement. You know, you move in the front of the body, the side of the body, the sagittal plane, and posterior. So there's all these movements. Uh, a synovial joint is one that's round. Who, who can think of a synovial joint? Your thumb, shoulder, shoulder. yes, a hinge joint, which would be your elbow. Uh huh. So whenever you have something that can go in a circle, imagine how many muscles are involved in that motion. So it's so cool when you think about the bones are no good at all unless the muscles are attached. Now, a little caveat, as we age, while the muscle strength is important, guess what's probably even more important to avoid aches and pains and, and stiffness? Your bones. The joints. Yeah, so increasing the synovial fluid in the joints, uh, getting the lymph system moving. And so that's why uh, Tai Chi and yoga are just as important as hiking and running and dancing because the joints need the contractions to get all that synovial fluid going, which again is because of the wonderful movement of those muscles. So we wanna really, I, I know, I, thinking about, I wanna move, right? Yeah, so 600 muscles and 250 to 350 joints. That's a lot of movement going on, right? And so even interesting that the skeletal muscles and the movement are important in helping the smooth muscle get activated. So uh, a little, I think an interesting caveat is when yoga is practiced in the Asian or even uh, Chinese medicine, uh, even just the culture, yoga is done to help in digestion. There's several different flows, yoga practice, that are all about improving digestion, all about improving the, the joint health. And so uh, this little lady that I was training, I'd mentioned she's in her 60s, and she has lots of gurgly, lots of gas, lots of you know IBS symptoms. And I said, well, the first thing we need to do is get you moving in the morning. And so lo and behold, I gave her a few exercises that you probably all know in your Tai Chi and yoga classes that help massage the internal organs that help her move. And so now her regularity is better. She doesn't have gas pains because she's doing these rhythmic motions that these muscles help 
have a real symbiotic relationship with the smooth muscle, which is in your in your tummy and your gut. So I love the fact that um, even though the skeletal muscle is really important in moving the bones to get together, there's also a benefit of these muscles and joints helping to move and activate our large intestine and our small intestine, so in digestion. So pretty cool. So that takes me to the smooth muscle. So now let's look a little bit at where do all these um, smooth muscles hang out? I alluded to it a little bit, but I have a list because I honestly did not, rem I don't have all these memorized, but I sure was kind of a intrigued to realize how much smooth muscle we have in our bodies. So throw out some ideas. I'll give you a hint. They're found in the walls of hollow organs. So what organs do we have Yes, so heart, I know I thought of that too, but remember I mentioned heart is super unique because it has to beat from the time we are conceived in the womb until we die, and it has to be super powerful. So the cardiac muscle, while it is a hollowed organ, you totally are right, it's not gonna have smooth muscle, but we do have stomach, we have intestines, you already mentioned. Anything else you can think of? Yes, we've got lung, we've got lymph nodes, we've got urinary tract, so bladder. What about when you have a baby? Oh, yes. Woo! Yes. Um, here's some interesting ones. This is erector pili, A R R E C T O R, pili, P I L I. So, this one we can figure, you know, you eat, you, you know that your stomach gets full and then it empties and there's some contraction going on to help move the contents throughout. Intestines, same thing, we, we all have felt that. And you can even sometimes hear the, the gas bubble or the rolling of the, the normal uh, movement of the bowel. With the lung, this one's kind of fun. So the lung itself is not actually hollow, but I wrote it down because it does have some very important villi that help, yep, that help to sweep up the, the, um, the debris. So if we're breathing and we get some dust or pollution, um, we don't notice it, but there's these little hairs that move because of sp smooth muscle activity to get those particles, those foreign particles out of our lungs. If you even choke on something and you have something that you know you, is there, your villi are working to get that foreign particle out of your lungs. So it's really cool that we don't have to think about that. Um, we don't have to push any buttons or think about it or exercise it. It just happens. Same thing with the lymph nodes. I mean, the lymph system is something that is so little understood. Um, we, we know that we have lymph. We know that we have lymph nodes that we worry about uh, spreading disease, but it's also a another freeway in our body that must travel all throughout. It goes uh, hand in hand with our circulatory system and is really important in transporting um, not only the um, parts of our immune system, but also extra fluid. And all of it's done by smooth muscle that is in the um, walls of those uh, lymph systems. Of course, bladder, we know that all too well. Um, and I mentioned uterus and um, the rector pili is a really fun one because that is those little tiny circular muscles that are around every hair follicle. So when you get cold, when you get shivers, when you are scared, isn't it interesting? Why would our bodies need to have our hair stand up when we're scared? Any ideas? To make us look bigger. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's what they say. And I have this little puppy. He's part Australian Shepherd, part Lab. And when he wrestles with the other dog, it's hilarious because all the hair on the back of his neck stands up. And it totally made me think of this. He's trying to look bigger. And, uh, you know, I don't think he thought about that and he's not working that muscle out to make himself look bigger. It just happens. And so there's so much of the autonomic nervous system that does a lot of the work for us. You know, we don't have to think of all these things. And I love the fact that it's part of our musculature and every muscle in our body has to have energy. And so glucose is that form of energy. A while back, maybe a couple of months ago, I talked a little bit about ATP. 
I'm not going to get into it today, but just know that if we eat foods like fats, proteins, everything on your best foods list, and carbs, all of these foods will make it into what we call the Krebs cycle. So the mitochondria of the cell and turn into glucose. Because remember, that's the stuff of life. Glucose is what all of our organs need to function. And so whether we're eating really concentrated amino acids or fatty acids or glucose, eventually that is what our body wants for energy. So those smooth muscle cells, those cardiac cells and the skeletal muscle all eventually want glucose as its primary uh, source of energy. Okay. So now we want to do a little bit of comparison. So I, I talked about um, the how interesting the smooth muscle is and the rhythmic contractions. Um, if we're following along on the slides, the next one is um, the capillary network. So we talked a little bit about how the um, cardiac muscle is so important because it's got to pump all the time. Uh, has anybody ever seen an EKG done? So it kind of looks like that. It's a lub-dub. So the cardiac cycle has this little, uh, it's a QR wave. Um, and so we have a P wave and then a QR and then it kind of um, fades off and starts again. So whenever the heart pumps, anybody know? Is that the lub or the dub? No, that's the lub. Okay, because it has to contract. And what's happening when the heart muscle contracts? All the blood flows into the lung to get its oxygen, and then it goes to the aorta and all throughout the body. When it relax on this side is when it's gonna uh, fill up with blood again. So what's really cool is we have this, um, the heart cycle, and it has this initial uh, relaxation, and then a big contraction and then another relaxation where it refills, refills with blood. So it has to completely relax. And what's happening there is filling with blood, completely relaxed, it fills with blood, and then it contracts really strong and it pushes all the, the strength of the, the uh, muscle in order to get the blood into the rest of the circulation. So it's got to go into the lungs and all of that's really with muscle control from the cardiac cells, but also the periphery has some contractibility as well to really help it. So I love that. Um, if we think of some of the heart diseases, I wanna give you a few of these little tidbits because it's, again, I think really interesting to think about the beauty of the, the skeletal versus the, the heart muscle. Um, if we have the, if we have hypertension, if we have maybe immune or viral, a viral infection, or if we have maybe um, drugs that have affected the, the heart muscle. So all of these are examples of ways that we can cause disease so that heart muscle isn't as strong. So with hypertension, what's happening is the the whole the artery is not as elastic and so it's not able to take on that strong lub dub or contraction and relaxation so it's making it more and more difficult to get oxygen around the body we know that when we measure um, hemoglobin in the blood anybody know what that does yeah there you go the hemoglobin carries the oxygen so not only do we need to get the actual blood down the freeways, but the blood has to be able to carry the oxygen. So if you know somebody that has insulin sensitivity and their blood sugar is high, well, now we've got sticky he uh, hemoglobin. So what am I alluding to here? Diabetes, either type one or type two. So when the hemoglobin is sticky, it's not able to carry enough oxygen. So we have two things happening. In some cases, 
like hypertension or an infection or somehow weakening the actual tissue of the heart muscle, or we're making that blood cell too sticky, what's happening? We can't get enough oxygenated blood to the cells. And so that's why we have an ischemic attack. So, so here we've got the heart and we've got the two chambers. We've got the atrium and the ventricles, right? And um, we've got the aorta back here and right here in this in the center it's kind of kind of going out towards us is going to the lungs and then it comes back in the very first organ that gets this rich oxygenated blood is the heart it goes right back to the heart because now it's going to go into this chamber and then out the aorta so see when the blood comes in from the periphery it's going to go in to the atrium, it's gonna go down to the ventric ventricle, and then it's gonna go into the lungs, back into the atrium, and then to the ventricle, and back up to the aorta. So it's a little um, path, but the first thing it does is feed itself, because we need really rich oxygenated blood to keep that heart muscle going. Uh, any idea how many heart pumps in a lifetime? So many. So many, right? So many. It's right. Yes, so many. But it's really amazing. I mean, we don't have to think about our heart pumping, and it does. And um, I, I just went in for a procedure myself, and they thought my heart rate was too slow. They're like, "Gosh, that's only forty nine. Are you okay?" <laughs> you know. And one of the things that happens, and it's probably genetics too, but bradycardia is too slow of a heart rate. And that's dangerous because for one, the heart's not gonna get enough oxygen and it finally poops out. And of course, then the organs too. Um, the other thing that if you are an athlete and you, start, and you start at a young age and you exercise your whole life, those muscle cells ch do change. And so you have an athletic heart syndrome Anything that has syndrome makes it sound bad, right? <laughs> but this is actually a good thing. It means that the heart itself is getting stronger and stronger. So especially on the left side of the heart, this muscle is getting stronger and stronger. And remember early on, I said that we really get the same number of heart cells. We're born, they do grow a little bit in early childhood, and then that's the number you get, and there's only like 50% turnover through your entire life. Now, the athletic heart syndrome is a little different because while the, they don't get new heart cells, the heart cells themselves do get stronger. So it's a really interesting thing because when the heart cell gets stronger, strong, now with every beat, guess what? More blood is pumped. And so instead of having to do the average of 70 beats per minute, the athletic heart can do 49 beats per minute. So it's, it's not having to work so hard. It's not a lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. It's a lub dub, lub dub. So the rhythm is still the same. You know, that little thing I showed you, the, the QRS code, and you know this is where you get that big contraction, pushing the heart um, muscle into a contraction and it gets the blood to go into the lungs and throughout the rest of the body. But you only have to do 40 of those in a, in a minute rather than 70. And so anybody know if you have low heart rate? No, yes. Um, and so if you have to take blood pressure medicine, the same idea. It's helping the smooth muscle in the arteries relax. So again, we're touching on those smooth muscle, helping them to relax so that the blood flow will be improved. Um, something that happens with age, you know, as we go, I'll go a little bit more into the, the slides on um, the aging body and how we can improve on it, we know that insulin sensitivity seems to be related to a term called sarcopenia. Um, insulin sensitivity, that's basically when um, our body 
isn't as sensitive to the foods we eat. So if we take in food that's a blend, maybe it's a burrito and you have a, a flour tortilla and you have some chicken and you have some veggies and cheese. Um, our body doesn't have as good of a response at pulling those nutrients out of the blood and into the muscle cell. So for some reason, insulin sensitivity has something to do with breaking down muscle with age. We're not exactly sure why, but I, I bring this one up because we all know how important it is to avoid insulin sensitivity. And so we talked about this before, but in general, exercise avoids this. So staying active means that your muscles are better at taking energy in from the blood and also making sure that we control the mix of food. So if we had um, a big bowl of ice cream and a ice cream cone and chocolate sprinkles, that is gonna promote insulin sensitivity, right? I'm giving you an obvious example, versus uh, salmon and salad, with, right? So we know the obvious. We know that what we eat has a big input on how well our body handles sugars. And so as divas and dudes, I just wanna remind you that you're doing so many things right to make sure that you don't have one of the primary culprits of sarcopenia. So let's look at that word a little bit more, sarcopenia. Um, that's basically when we have breakdown or shrinkage of our muscles, specifically skeletal muscle, but it does kind of happen with all the muscle. Um, which is why the little lady that I'm helping, the 60 some year old lady, her GI tract isn't going so well. And it all works so much in concert because if, if you are inactive, a lot of things are affected. Your heart, so cardiovascular system, and even your GI tract. So, um, so if we go to, let's see the slide that I'm on now, and I'm gonna get back to the muscles perform in just a second. Um, we talked a little bit about um, sarcopenia, meaning a reduction or decrease in muscle. And so we know that the, the reasons this happens, it's the insulin sensitivity, but also obvious is inactivity. Sometimes nutrition too. And so metabolic changes can certainly happen. and in a, uh, endocrine changes. So I'm gonna talk about these just a little bit because some of these things we, we have control over and some we don't, right? So um, if we think of age, you know, of course we can't stop the clock, but just because we're getting older doesn't mean we're gonna be less active. Just because we're getting older doesn't mean we have to have metabolic changes like the insulin sensitivity that I mentioned. Um, endocrine changes I also kind of alluded to. So if you, um, as you age, our, our hormone systems change, but we can influence those. Again, it's a feedback loop. The more activity we do and the more muscle we have on board, the more testosterone we have because the muscles help to degenerate those positive endocrine changes. So sarcopenia is what we see a lot in the elderly, but it doesn't have to happen. So I, I put in a couple of cool pictures. Um, I love the fact that these two little ladies are both in their 80s. I think the one, the uh, African-American is 87 and the other lady is I think 82. Yeah, have you? I love the fact, look at their muscles. So cool. Yeah, there's, there's a few out there. Um, and so, you know, how do we keep the muscles activated and not have injury? Well, one thing for sure is that we have to be so careful listening to, you know, young personal trainers that say, you know, go, go through the burn you know, so many reps until you throw up, you know, those kinds of things where they push you so hard and they feel like if you're gonna pay for a workout, you have to, you know, drag yourself out. 
Um, when I worked for years in, in the fitness industry, the younger trainers felt like they needed to get you your money's worth. So if you weren't super sore, then they didn't give you a good workout. And so back to the little 60 year old lady, what I tried to teach her is that we want to understand um, what that range is. You know, how do we stay active through the years and not have an injury that's going to slow us down? Because let's face it, these little these guys that are in their 80s and still exercising um, for sure have been able to avoid serious injury and recovery. So, you know, activity really means let that movement be fun let it change through the ages so what you could do at 20 doesn't need to be what you do at 50 and 60 and 70 um, but we do know that having a blend of activities is really important so when you go through a an exercise class or you go on a hike what types of exercise do you focus on Cardio. yep so we have endurance activities we have strength activities and then we also have the really important flex flexibility flexibility so important to get all of those and even this is another one balance balance work actually activates the core muscles and so as you're doing exercises like the yoga and um, again, even Tai Chi um, really does help you to get nervous connection to the muscles. And once you get nervous connection to the muscles, now you get even more blood flow, you get more contraction. So remember that sarcomere or that skeletal muscle cell that all it does is bring the two filaments closer together. But when you have more innervation, you get more activity. So the same thing that happens when you have insulin sensitivity. If you don't have good um, connectivity to that cell, you really lose out on getting the good muscle um, energy or the absorption of the sugars. So we always wanna focus on each category of the work. Um, it, it surprisingly, endurance exercise, while it doesn't necessarily make the muscles look bigger, it does increase their size. It's not quite the same as the big burly bicep, but it does increase the amount of oxygen that that muscle can take up. It increases the amount of me metabolic forces so it can use more sugar. So walking and using your big muscle groups are gonna be really key in the endurance training that we do. Adding good old strength to a muscle, frankly, has so much to do with that muscle innervation. Um, have you ever tried to um, maybe do a push-up and you feel like you don't know what muscles you need to think about to work? Good thing is with the muscle innervation, your body can take over. But if somebody said, okay, I want you to do a one arm push-up, now you have to really think about it. You've got to pull in activation or, or neuro connection to the muscle to make that happen, right? Because a push-up, you think, okay, I'm gonna... then when you do one, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. I have to really reconfigure the activation of the muscles. So I love it that strength training turns on new activation of your neurochemistry to your muscles. And that's the first step in making sure that sarcopenia doesn't happen. We need that nerve connection. And I, I mentioned a little bit of a flexibility component too, because for sure as we get older, older the, um, the joints become more stiff. We've heard of calcification. You know, we talked a little bit about this when we were going through all the, the vitamin supplementation and how important having vitamin K is in our diet. Because if we're going to take vitamin D, we're going to get strong bones. If we don't have K, all that good calcium, what does it do? It accidentally stays in the wrong places. Remember, we learned about calcification of the arteries and the joints and kidney, and you get kidney stones. All of that is not good because we gotta make sure the calcium gets into the right spot. So flexible joints really is a part of moving those joints, getting good hydration, and making sure you get all your nutrients. So I love that flexibility uh, is something that we can always work on. And sadly, it gets a little harder as we get older, but it doesn't mean we should stop.
So, you know, when we think about, well, what, what's a good feeling of a, of a stretching joint? Um, and you gotta ease into it because if you have never taken a yoga class and you try it and you think, what, I'm supposed to touch my toes, <laughs> right? And it feels like it's too far there. Don't let your neighbor or the instructor say, go, go, push hard, get there ease into it because the last thing we want to do is cause a pulled muscle and now we've got to start all over let it heal and it'll slow you down so we definitely don't want that to happen and then the balance part is also really cool because when you work balance you're working so many connections and anytime we can include the neurochemistry into our muscular strength that is going to help us with avoiding falls and building strength, as well as the uh, endurance of the muscles to hold us up. In fact, sitting in your chair right now, are you thinking about the erector spinae muscles and the rhomboids holding you straight in your chair? Of course not, but they are. And so we tend to sit in a chair and we don't know all those muscles that are getting tight. So sometimes we need to get up, move them around and let that synovial fluid start to move increase the metabolism in those muscles, even though they're static holding our back straight, we need to move them around and get some of the toxins out. And where does it go? Well, a little bit of the bloodstream, but also in the lymph system. When we move those muscles around and get the toxins out, the lymph system is really important. The lymph system is the smooth muscle. So they really are so much interplaying with each type of muscle. The cardiac muscle gets the oxygen to every working muscle. The smooth muscle, even though it's really in the cell walls of hollow organs, so many hollow organs that help us breathe freshly in good air and help us digest and absorb the food. And of course, with the lymph system, those smooth muscle gets all of our uh, immune cells to every part of the body. And so I love the fact that, you know, part of fitness isn't just getting out and kicking a soccer ball and lifting weights and doing a run. It's really this wonderful interplay of how strong our heart muscle needs to be. And of course, our intestine really depends on our strong skeletal muscles to move. All about the range of motion that allows those 300 joints to uh, sync up and get us from point A to B and absolutely to have fun while we're doing it. So I hope that helps. Um, probably the in closing, the main thing that I wanted to share with you is some of the fun um, kind of pictures. I, I alluded to it earlier, but um, I gave you some ideas around body type. Because again, genetics has a big role to play in our body type and how our muscles respond to that external stimulus, which is you know what we call exercise. So we're gonna have a little fun with this. So um, I know it, this one's hard to read. So the mesomorph has um, shoulders and hips that are um, about the same. So if we have our, our pretty lady and her shoulders and hips are about the same, she has, um, very little waist, so she's not curvy, so straight waist. So basically that just means opposite of curvy, right? Shoulders and hips are about the same, so uh, balanced shoulders and hips. <coughs> Probably small busted, so you know lower body fat, we'll just say, not always, but lower body fat um, for the, the mesomorph. Is that the athletic mesomorph? Uh-huh. Okay. Yep. So you probably, if you see, um, you know, young girls on a playground and they're seven, eight, ten, you could probably pick out which ones are mesomorph. Even if they haven't gone through puberty and don't have, you know, big or small breasts, they, they have this sort of body type. And they're most likely the ones that are on the soccer field, running around playing, chasing the boys on the playground, because their bodies are kind of meant to move. And then as we go to a little different body type, the ectomorph, the difference is here in an ectomorph. So do you, are you starting to see where you might fit? Or is it hard to tell? Yeah? yeah? Ectomorph, 
ectomorph. Now this one is typically going to have narrow shoulders, probably a little bit of a difference. So a little bit more narrow shoulders than hips um, and still going to have a straight waist. So narrow shoulders. Um, she's going to be thin, so still lower body fat, but we're going to say lowest body fat. <clears throat> she doesn't love to run. She doesn't love to uh, leap and play, but she probably is pretty smart. Narrow shoulders. Now, um, sometimes with if an ectomorph starts to gain weight, this is where it's very interesting. So again, you're going to notice these body types before they've been around the world too much, right? So as a as an ectomorph ages, they're most likely going to turn into an apple. It's like, oh darn, <laughs> because even though they're with that. It, even though they're thin, they're low body fat, um, the apple shape tends to be where they trend if they're inactive and they're eating the wrong stuff and they're not challenging their muscles. So they get more of their adiposity right there in the center. And that's because the ectomorph doesn't tend to have um, a lot of muscle on board. And the muscle is a good way to store fat and glycogen. We're going to talk about glycogen next time. So then we have the endomorph. So in the endomorph, they actually sadly turn into a pear. And their shoulders and hips are narrow. So the waist, these are people that are going to be a little more fluffy, just right out of the gate they're going to tend to have more weight, a little more fluffy. Um, they have a little bit more of a hip and as they age, they turn into a pear, right? I know, isn't this sad? So their shoulders, that's really bad. Let me try this again. Their shoulders are narrow, their hips are wide. It's a little bit wider hips. And so as they age, their, their weight, tends to be um, on the lower part of the body. <laughs> Heck no. <laughs> that is not for me to say. <laughs> no, you're not. You're a mesomorph. Um, but so it's kind of fun to imagine that, yeah, there's, there's certain traits that we're born with. Um, my older son was absolutely ectomorph, skinny as a rail. He would sit and read books. He wouldn't do anything. And then the summer when he went into junior high, he decided he didn't want to be teased. And he did the P90X for a summer. And he, now he is a huge mesomorph. In fact, that picture with all the muscles on that one guy could have been my boy. And so, you know, when it's the right time of life, when you start your, your focus on your physical strengths, it's better if you don't start at 67. It's better if you start at six or seven. Now, this little lady that I'm helping, of course we're gonna help her, but it's much more difficult when you're behind the curve of the hormonal influences and the, you know, the 50 years of life that you've trained your body to do certain things. Now, having said that, if you were an athlete when you were younger, that is still in there. And so bring that back and be able to really celebrate some of those things that you loved naturally. If you hated running as a kid, don't do running when you're in your 60s. If you loved dance when you were a kid, do dance when you're older because your body type will probably really um, lend itself to those gifts. We need the kids outside playing. We do. We need the kids outside playing. And that's why the... The Fitness Fanatics group, I was so glad because I think that we as parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles forget that kids need to learn how to and enjoy their bodies. And so thank you so much. I'm so excited to have you uh, at Powerhouse Bakery and learning more about fitness. Okay.